So hi, uh, just to be clear, I am Ben, uh, that person right there, and we are extremely excited to talk to you about all the different awesome things that Play brings to the table to help grow your games business on Play. And we kicked off with something pretty exciting earlier today. It's about time we retired the 50 megabyte limit, and now it's 100 megabytes. The 50 might. 50 megabyte limit is dead. <laughs> Long live 100 megabytes. So this is like definitely the top request for a very, very long time. So I figured we could probably, probably can't stress this point enough. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Hi, everybody. I'm John McGuire. I'm on the Google Play business development team. Um, and you know, I think that's really exciting news as well. So thanks for uh, bearing with us there while it was at 50. Um, so we're with a bunch of. Oh, yep, yeah, I'm going to need this. Um, we're th with a bunch of game developers in the room, um, but r I want to take a quick audience poll to see how many of you have made a mobile game. So put your hands in the air if you have. Almost everybody. Uh, Almost keep everybody. your hands in the air if you thought it was easy. Yeah, it was a mobile, OK, one or two, <laughs> three. Well, making a mobile game is not easy. Um, and I've done it myself as well. Um, and I want to take you to the sort of the five phases that you know, we and I went through making the game and then how play can help you there. So first, you have the ideation stage. And this is really the most fun stage. It involves probably a conference room, uh, some pizza, a lot of stickies. And uh, you're really coming up with an idea like maybe the zombie match three card battler. Um, pretty quickly, you then decide on an idea that you want to then bring to a prototype. And you want to move as quickly as possible to get your game on a device. And the theme of the prototyping phase is all about iteration. How, how quickly can you turn around feedback in your game and make the game better? And then once you're ready to sort of you know, get some real KPIs behind the game, you might move into soft launch. And this is where you're picking a territory, or maybe several, and you're soft launching it to get KPIs and see how the market's reacting to your game. And then finally, if you decide to launch your game, you then, that's a pretty big moment, and you want to build as much in consumer anticipation as possible. There's a lot of champagne, a lot of celebration. A lot of champagne. And that was actually the easy part, because then you have to run your game as a live service, and that, that's actually the hardest part. Um, so we're here to talk to you today about all the ways that play can help you uh, in these various phases. Now, we can't quite help you yet with the ideas phase, but we might get there one day. So alpha beta testing. Earlier today, Ellie mentioned uh, just talked about alpha beta testing. Uh, so this is a feature in the developer console that allows you to upload an APK, and you can upload it to either alpha or beta. And there's two important characteristics of this. The first is that users always have to opt in to either alpha or beta. And the second is that they can't leave reviews. And so while your game is in the prototyping phase, this is actually a really good way for you to iterate quickly without being penalized for something going wrong in a game or a bug. Um, Secondly, uh, alpha or beta can be open or closed. And this is something we launched uh, several months ago. I think it was two months ago. So in closed testing, this might be a, a set of trusted testers where you actually invite via email. And so you have to invite them, and then they opt in, and then they can be a part of your, your group. Open beta, or open alpha, either one, uh, is where you actually get a URL, and then you can distribute that URL, and anybody with the URL um, can, can download and play your game. Um, and you know, I think back to when I made the ga a game uh, in 2012, a long time ago, we actually didn't have this. Uh, and this would, this would have been a really useful feature. And how I would have used it um, was I would have started off in closed beta with like a set of family and friends and maybe our game team. And then I would have moved to open beta uh, after that uh, to collect greater feedback from a broader set of people. Um, one of the ways you can distribute the game, if you have like marketing channels, you can put the URL there. Um, and yeah, I think it's a really great feature and one that we're going to continue to build on. So you're ready to uh, take your game to soft launch. Um, we, the soft launch is a really important phase because uh, it's one of the first moments where consumers actually see in your game. And we've built some features that allow you to help optimize your game um, during soft launch. And this is called store listing experiments. So to give us some context, the store listing experiment solutions that are in the marketplace today are expensive. They 
are imperfect as well. And you can see here a quote from Rovio, where they spent $50,000 uh, testing over a six-month period, uh, basically their icons and descriptions in the game. Um, and that is an imperfect solution, and we wanted to make it better. So a few months ago, we launched store listing experiments. So this allows you to test your icon, your video, your images, and your short and long description. I mentioned earlier that, you're, that this is one of the first times that a consumer is actually seeing your game in a marketplace. So while your game is in soft launch, you could imagine testing things like your icon, which is actually the, the most visible thing to a, a consumer and one of the things you might have the most questions about during your development. Here's an example from a developer that we work with called named Congregate. Uh, you can see here that there's the, the, during their soft launch, they optimized or tested their game, game's icon, and they saw a 91% increase in the number of installs they got um, per impression. And you think about like, the effect of that, where you're effectively you know, having the cost of your CPI just by making these types of improvements. When I look at something like this, I have, I have like, really no idea in advance like, which one of these could possibly work. Is it, is it Mr. Eyepatch? Is that the best one? Is it the girl with the gun? Is it the girl with the red hair? Or is it the helicopter? Nobody knows. It's impossible to tell. Yeah, exactly. And that's, and that's one of the things we really recommend as a best practice during soft launch is optimizing these kind of unknown things like what, which icon is going to resonate well uh, with players. So you've made the decision to launch your game. Uh, that's a really big moment. Um, and we want to help you build as much consumer anticipation as possible. So a few months ago, we built a product called Pre-Registration. So I'm a big Arnold Schwarzenegger fan. Um, there was a movie that came out this summer uh, that was called Terminator Genesis, and it had the 1984 Arnold in it and the 2014 Ar Arnold in it. And so I went to the a developer, uh, Glue, created a game um, that was uh, in conjunction with the movie release. And so I go to this marketing page that they've created, and I click on the Click Here to Pre-Register button. I'm then taken into the store, where I can then see a big inviting green button that says, Click Me to Pre-Register. I then get a notification that says, Hey, when we launch, we're actually going to send you a push notification to let you know that we've launched. And I really like that. So I click OK, I got it. I can then go down the page and see a bunch of videos of explosions, um, some marketing material, and things of that nature. I can also share the game and see what other games that the developer has made. We're all busy people. Uh, sometimes we forget about launches, although I didn't forget about this one. Um, but when the game launched, I got a push notification that says, hey, the game is launched. Come play it. So I click on the push notification, I'm taken to the store, and I can start playing the game. Um, we think this is a really important feature that will allow you to build a ton of consumer anticipation for your game. Uh, if you're interested in this feature, uh, talk to your business development manager uh, about it. So that's all the stuff up until and when you launch the game. Now Ben's going to talk to you about the stuff of running your game, uh, running your game as a live service. All right, let's see if we can. Yay, that worked. All right. So, as John mentioned, you now have launched your game. You've got it in the market, and now it's time to figure out how to go from just merely launching a game to having like a thriving, successful business on play. And Play Game Services, the area that I'm a product manager for, is built from the ground up to support this transition to being a successful franchise and a, franchi a very successful game. And when, you, when I think about what we're trying to do. It's about giving people and developers a way to create new and exciting goals for players, new things for them to do inside of the game that go beyond the core game loop. Things like achievements, leaderboards, player analytics, quests, multiplayer, all these different services together make a cohesive product that allows you to be more successful. And when I think about like, what we're trying to do, our core mission, as a Play Game Services team, I like to frame it around the story of a guy named Eric Fromling. Eric is the archetype of the developer we want to help with Play Game Services. He's a one-man army that does literally everything for his game. He's the artist. He's the animator. He's the game designer. He's also head of user acquisition. All of the things. 
But for Eric to be successful, he needs to think about his business as an ongoing service he delivers to players. And a big chunk of what he has to do, right, is to compete with the largest possible developers, right? We have armies of quants and armies of developers and armies of artists. So our mission is to help make Eric competitive with big studio capabilities, and that's what we're trying to do with Play Game Services. And it really starts off with this, the idea of giving people the insights they need to run their business. And so that's why we launched Player Analytics earlier this year. And Player Analytics is a set of reports in the developer console that give you insight into what's going on in your game. And this is a great example. So we have something called the Sources and Sinks report that we offer to developers. And in the build up to GDC earlier in the year, we spent a lot of time with Eric. We built numerous prototypes of different reports so that we could vet the ideas. And when we took a look at the data and we shared these reports with, with Eric, we found that there was a major imbalance in his in-game economy. It's a classic problem. You're giving away too much premium currency, but you don't have enough uses of that premium currency in the game. In his case, he has premium currency called tickets, and he was giving tickets away at an outrageous rate, and ultimately it was making it virtually impossible for people to have a moment in the game when they needed to make an in-app purchase. And so we gave him this report. He was able to quickly identify clearly that there was something going on that he needed to improve. So he made a couple of changes to his game, and he could immediately see the impact. The line switched. The blue line, the sinks, actually exceeded for the first time in his game ever the, the rate at which he was giving them away. That's a huge transition for him. And in three short weeks, he saw average revenue per daily active user more than double, and average revenue per paying user grow by almost 70%. That's almost unheard of impact to have in such a, a short period of time. And we're continuing to invest in more reports that drive additional value for you guys. Uh, and in particular, Eric, so they have the quote here, player analytics has helped me home in on bomb squad shortcomings, right the ship, and get to a point where I can financially, financially justify making the games I want to make. And, and again, we're pushing the needle further with new stuff for you guys. So just recently we launched something called the Time Series Explorer. The Time Series Explorer is a report that helps you understand what's happening in the most critical moments of your game. What happens when people first start playing? What happens just before they leave the game? And you have the ability to compare different segments of players so you can see what your big spenders are doing versus your small spenders versus people who have never spent at all in your game. And you can get a credible level of detail here. So for example, on line three here, player number three, he spent or she spent $4.99 and then before that, you could see that they've earned a number of different achievements. And if you hover your cursor over each one of these shapes, you get another level of detail about what's going on. So, and just to give you some background here, what, what you're seeing here, each one of these rows represents a different player and all of the unique events that happen during the game. And every day, we take all of these time series and we take a sample of those and we display them to you so you can deepen your understanding, develop an intuition about what's going on in your game, what's working and not working. And we helpfully provide some presets for this report. So configurations that answer a particular type of question. So for example, you can choose to ask the question, what happens at the start of gameplay? Where am I losing my players? Is the tutorial wrong? You can ask the question, what happens before first spend, which you can actually see right here. And what we do is we align all of the first spend events with each other, and you can just scan to the left, see everything that happened before they spent for the first time, and scan to the right to see everything that happened afterwards. And you can compare different player segments, like I mentioned before, so you can develop, again, an intuition about what's working really well, what's getting your big spenders to behave in that way, versus what's happening to those people who spend very little. And of course, you need to understand why people are leaving your game. So again, we have another pre-configured report here 
that allows you to line up all of the churn events for all the people that have left your game in the last 28 days. And you can scan very easily to the left here to understand what is driving this. Is it because people are losing too often in the tournament mode? Do I need to improve matchmaking? You can discover all of these things. And we offer a set of custom events that you can add as well. So in addition to all the default things that get put in here, spend and achievements and so forth and sessions, you can log your own custom events. So any piece of information you would like to see visualized in this report, you can trivially do that by adding an event in your game. And you'll absolutely, in the next day, be able to see this data flow through this report. And you can develop an understanding about that specific type of data that you're looking for. And we also launched something called the Events Viewer. This is a general purpose like event uh, visualizing tool. And you know, to give you some background here, you know, going back to pre-GDC, early in the year when working with Eric, the prototyping phase of that, we worked with a commercial BI product, something that you would have to purchase. And we took all the raw events data, we dumped it in this commercial BI tool, and we generated basically prototypes of all the reports. Right? But it was in that process that we learned what are the key things, what are the types of reports, what are the key types of visualizations that were important. And we took all of the use cases that we found during the prototyping phase for player analytics, we took all those key use cases and we put them into the product. And so the events viewer here captures all of the powerful things in this very expensive commercial BI product and we made them available for free in the developer console just for integrating play game services. But insights are not enough, right? We're all very happy with insights. We give you the best insights in the world. But you actually have to be able to take action in your game in order for the core metrics in your KPIs to improve. And that is why we have launched a feature called Quests. What Quests are are time-based objectives for your entire community of players. So like the canonical example of a Quest is uh, from this game here, Tower Madness 2, from a partner, Limbic. And they have a weekend quest. And every weekend, you can see in the Games app, which is a sort of a companion app to all these services, that there's an upcoming quest. You can accept the quest, join the game, complete the quest inside the game, earn the reward in the form of wool, I believe, in this game. And it's a fabulous way of re-engaging your player after the launch of a game without requiring your players to actually update and get a new APK. So dynamic delivery of content. That's a big theme here. And taking your insights and moving into the action phase. And so I'll go through a, a short case study on a partner of ours, Concrete Software. So they've been around for a while. These guys are 10, 15 people and mostly engineers. And every single minute that they're spending on server infrastructure and live operations is taking away from what they would really like to do is work on the game. And so with Quest, they see an opportunity to get a big studio capability that would have required lots of server infrastructure and other types of support. And they get that for free and frees up some time to work on their passion, making games. And this is their flagship title, PBA Bowling. So John, do you, you a bowler? I'm an awful bowler, but it doesn't stop me from trying. But everybody can be a rock star bowler in PBA Bowling. The, uh, it's quite fulfilling. And they have an amazing implementation of quests. They followed all of our best practices to a T. And what was particularly exciting about this use case is that they've made it an integral part of the way they deliver new content to players. And here's an example. So this is the calendar of promotions from January this year. And you can see multiple times a week, multiple times a week, they deliver new content to players. Like on January 7, they launched the Hammer Black Widow Legend Bowling Ball. An amazing bowling ball. Honestly, it's a little scary how awesome it is. And along with the new bowling ball, they had an advertisement inside the game. They pushed notifications. They sent out tweets and so forth, social media. And along with every single one of these pushes of new content, they also had a quest. And the reason why they made quest such an integral part of their live operations strategy is because it had a measurable material impact on user engagement. So what they found when they looked at the data was that the, on the day that a quest is accepted, sessions per user were 15% higher than their benchmark, and that that impact was sticky. 
After request was completed, sessions were 4% higher still. So you can understand why they have made that such a core component of the way they deliver new content to players. And we're continuing to invest in this theme of taking action to insight with the Player Stats API. So the Player Stats API is something we just very recently launched along with the, uh, the latest version of the Play Services SDK. And what it does is it gives you a way, it gives you a way of finding out information about what segment your players are in. So I'll give you an example. So let's say someone starts a session in your game. They've signed in. You can call the Player Stats API and find out they're a 95th percentile spender in your game. You can find out that they haven't been in your game for about 10 days, and you could show them a glorious promotion saying, welcome back, and here are some coins, things you could use in the game to buy something awesome for yourself. And so the key player stats is being able to deliver tailored experiences for every segment of your player base. And you can get things like what uh, session percentile they're in, session length. And we're going to continue to just pile stats into this API. And we think that it will deliver an enormous amount of value. Another good example here is let's say you want to monetize your players through incentivize ads. It's a very common pattern now. Some of our partners make up to 50% of their revenue through incentivize ads like this. But maybe you don't want to show the incentivize ad option to everybody. Maybe you want to reserve that to people that are unlikely to ever spend any money in your game. So again, somebody logs in, you call the API, you can find out that they're a lower percentile spender who happens to be highly engaged with the game. That is exactly the type of person you want to deliver this particular option to. And with that, so we talked about all of the different ways that play can deliver value throughout the life cycle of a game. And it's still incredibly hard to make a good game, a successful game. But with the services that John talked about and integrating play game services, those types of things are the first step to success. And we can open the floor for some Q&A. Questions? I see a hand, I think. And you mentioned being able uh, to check a churn point uh, for users. Is that, a, is that defined by the developer, or is that preset by the um, Google Play Analytics? Uh, so how, how we define churn? Yeah. OK, so the, the question was, how do we define churn? So it is something that we set on the behalf of everybody. Um, but the, there is a standard formula for this. If someone hasn't been around for seven days, they're classified retrospectively as having churned on the, the last day that they played, the last event we have. And if I want, if, you know, say for my game, I wanted to flex that out, I'd, you know, define it as 10 days or 14 days, could I do that? Not today. But uh, this is why we're having you guys here. This is great feedback. So come grab me over some beers during the happy hour, and we can talk all about the different ways you would like to modify the classification of a churn user. Thank you.